they describe basically the core type of near-death experience that you see in adults, or that we've heard on talk shows. First of all, the out-of-body experience. This is the kind of out-of-body experience I can relate to. <laughs> the only sort of out-of-body experience I've uh, ever uh, tried to, uh, to have. That's not what these patients describe. This is what they describe. Now, I think this is very important. They, they describe themselves as hovering over their own body, viewing their own body. And again, in contrast to what I often see in the media, uh, hear on talk shows, or see uh, in movies, these patients do not describe the autoscopic uh, type of out-of-body experience where they zoom down hallways, go travel into distant lands, and such as that. They are preoccupied with their own body, and by and large, they report the details of their own resuscitation accurately. And here's a nice example of this. This is a young girl who nearly died of fulminant bacterial meningitis had a lengthy and extensive uh, hospital resuscitation. Here's my partner here, Dr. David Christopher. He has his hands perfectly interdigitated over her sternum, properly placed. The author of this uh, drawing, uh, a nine-year-old girl, she has properly drawn a hat uh, at our hospital. Uh, it is the, um, our custom that the team leader uh, wear a hat so that they can be instantly identified uh, in the hub of resuscitation. Here we see the crash cart, and then here she is, and then she's floating out of her body. She sees, she draws this rainbow, which she tells me was a light that told her who she was and where she was to go. And then we also see some religious figures here. If there's Christians in the audience, uh, you'll be happy to know uh, that she identified this as Jesus and said he is very nice. <laughs> And then, of course, don't forget this. I like you very, very much, Dr. Morse. <laughs> okay, and then they have a perception of entering into darkness. This is a young boy um, who nearly drowned uh, in a swimming pool. Here he is. He claimed that hands reached into his body and pulled him out. Here are the hands. He then was plunged into total darkness. So again, Susan Blackmore, uh, the brilliant uh, neuroscientist uh, from England, has an elegant computer model of how the near-death experience is nothing more than the disinhibition of cortical uh, impulses uh, from the retinal, vest, retinal uh, neurons at the point of death. That the light is nothing more than the collapse of the visual field um, to a central point. Brilliant. Uh, no doubt about it. Doesn't match the clinical data that we hear. These patients are very clear about it. I entered into darkness. It's much more likely that darkness represents the total shutdown of their conventional uh, senses. After that darkness then comes the light. This boy did not have a religious type of experience. Instead, he had a pup tent and a golden field. That's what heaven is for him. You can see over here again that rainbow, which seems to pop up again and again in these pictures. And they travel in this time. Here's a young boy who had malignant hyperthermia during a routine uh, tonsillectomy, had three interoperative cardiac arrests. He says, forget my body, forget being alive, I just wanted to get down that tunnel to that light. That's his entire experience. Don't ask me what these are. <laughs> it's great working with kids, too, because virtually every question you ask them, they say, I don't know. They don't embroider. They don't embellish. They, you know, he drew these for me, and I said, what are they? I don't know. <laughs> and then they see a light. And this light is not some sort of reflex spasm of the optic nerve. It is not some sort of dysfunctional firing of the occipital lobe. Uh, that doesn't do justice to it. Uh, this is clearly a light that is intermingled with emotions, perceptions, and loving memories. This uh, young girl here, um, she presented to our office, uh, interestingly enough, in fulminant uh, liver failure from mononucleosis. She requ uh, required intracardiac epinephrine uh, as part of her resuscitation. She said that during that experience, 
she saw a light that was appeared at her bedside. And in the middle of that light is her grandma. And she goes, I was just so shocked to see her. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly, her grandmother had died two years, years earlier of cancer and uh, was a very comforting image to her in life. We heard earlier from Patrick Nicholson, it was his pets, you know, also comforting images to them. And then they often decide to return. Let's talk about these comforting images. So one, one thing, regardless of your philosophical bias is, we see comforting, meaningful, loving images that come to us from our own lives, from events in our own lives, when we die. That's a beautiful insight. That, that's certainly a lot different than I thought death and dying was before I went into this kind of research. Okay, the decision to return, many of these children perceive themselves as deciding to return. Um, this is a difficult, difficult, horrible area to understand. Because please remember that many, many people then say, why didn't my child decide to return? My child loved me. Why didn't my child come back? And I don't, I don't have a lot of answers when it comes to understanding these experiences. And the one thing I want to share with you is to listen to these experiences and, and, and cry with your patients and hold their hand and just simply let them make sense of these experiences themselves. And don't be so quick to have an explanation for why their child might come back, etc. But I, I do think that, you know, I, I do remind myself that these patients are patients who are truly at the brink of life and death. I mean, no matter how much you love your mommy, you can't regrow, you know, uh, dead neurons or a totally damaged heart tissue. Um, you know, none of these patients are after-death experiences. None of these patients are miraculous uh, beyond uh, the understanding of, uh, uh, of medical science. I, I think it's important to, to understand that. These are patients who have started the dying process and have it had, had that process uh, stopped by medical technology. Nevertheless, these patients frequently say they decided to return. Uh, this uh, young girl here, who presented with diabetic ketoacidosis with a blood glucose level of over 3,000, she stated that three doctors were at her bedside. She's not religious. She said these doctors, um, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't only mean that a more religious child, I think, would call these angels. She said they were very tall. They had light bulbs in their bodies. <laughs> and she said they told her to press a button on this box. And if she pressed the green button, she could go with them, but never see her parents again. And uh, so a very mechanistic uh, near-death experience, and that yet nevertheless uh, clearly uh, cut from the same cloth as the other. It's interesting to reflect a little bit on the difference between children's experiences and adults. They often see pets. They often see living teachers. So, you know, I, I see sometimes people take these experiences a little too literally. You know, you know obviously, uh, heaven is not some sort of pup tent in a golden field that we're going to actually physically go to when we die. Um, and uh, many uh, children uh, say, I saw my teacher there. You know, that's a powerful, comforting, authoritarian uh, figure uh, for them. Children often describe guardian angels, and they have a very age-appropriate vision of a heavenly God. Uh, very young children will just say things like, uh, I saw a pretty lady uh, with bright lights. Uh, older children uh, will describe um, flower-filled scenes. And then when you get the teenagers, they describe the more adult kind of, you know, castles and heavenly gates uh, and such as that. So obviously... It's obvious that these experiences are born of our own psychology. By that I mean that, the, you know, remember I'm taking a philosophically neutral uh, point of view here. I'm not saying whether or not uh, this God that they perceive is a real God or really exists outside our body or not. I'm only making the common sense observation that when we die, comforting images from our own lives appear to us. And that's enormously comforting, at least to me. It's, I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that if my wife dies before me, that I will see her again when I die. That, that There's no other conclusion you can reach uh, from near-death research. Um, um, and certainly I know from the letters that I get, you know, tear-stained letters from 
thousands of, of parents. That is one of the most comforting aspects to them. And they don't say, thank you, Dr. Morse, for proving my child is in heaven. They say, thank you for letting me know that my child was not alone when the doctors took them back, back and did all those things. And I felt horribly guilty about letting them stick all those needles and do all that stuff that I knew wouldn't do any good anyway. And yet now I know that, you know, X, whether it's grandma or this or that, was there during the experience. Now I understand what my child meant when they said, the moon, the moon, I'm on a rocket ship to the moon. They were having this experience. That's enormously powerful. Whether the experience is born of serotonin mechanisms in the brain or represents the functioning of our right temporal lobes to communicate with God. I, I don't think, frankly, from our patients' viewpoint, that they really care. <laughs> you know, that's a... Uh, that's, uh, uh, it's too deep for me, I'll just uh, tell you, uh, to get involved in that sort of thing. So it's my strong opinion, not only from my own research, but from my review of the medical literature, that these experiences are real events. And by real, I mean they are as real as any other human emotion and experience. And leave it to the philosophers to define what is, you know, real. And they are clearly not some sort of diffuse reaction of a chaotic brain to anoxia. They are linked to right-sided, deep temporal lobe brain activity. There's no doubt about it. Now, let me uh, review that with you. This comes, first of all, from the work of uh, Wilder Penfield, the father of neurosurgery. Um, from when he uh, mapped uh, the cerebral cortex of man uh, and did electrical stimulation studies uh, of um, uh, of, of the brain, he clearly showed that deep within the sylvian fissure, every element of the near-death experience can be replicated. No doubt about it. In these areas here, this slide, I'm sorry, is backwards, but these areas here, patients said things like, oh God, I'm leaving my body. Or even more fascinatingly, I'm half in and I'm half out. The same area of the brain, when he stimulated all these other areas, had elements of flashbacks from their lives, heavenly music, <coughs> images of, of heaven, seeing uh, three-dimensional representational uh, representations of uh, what, you know, uh, what he would just call beings and might, uh, with, I think, uh, you know, someone else would call uh, angels, etc. I believe strongly uh, that uh, these experiences come from our temporal lobes and they can be triggered from a wide variety of different uh, stresses. And emotional stresses, color brushes with death. LSD and ketamine could cause strikingly similar, uh, but as I pointed out, uh, definitely different uh, types of experiences uh, than uh, near-death experiences. But these experiences have a neurobiological basis to them. 